This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So as a, as a documentarian, I mean, is this the greatest material you've ever had? A supposedly liberal institution, a college, going after urban farmers for the benefit of corporations? This, yeah, this is, this is the best movie I've ever made, yeah, for sure. It was a pleasure to, um, the serendipity of it all happening mm -hmm. was great, and the, um, the feeling of being in sync with the people and the story was unusual. You know, you usually feel some distance between something, but in this, I, I, it was really, it was really fun to be in sync with it. I, I really liked the people. the The issues were are enormously powerful. Um, it's happening at a time that's of great consequence. You know, global cl the climate change. I mean, we've got a ticking clock. We have climate change. The economy's crashed. The economy is stagnant. There's suddenly, there's more social and political engagement at this moment than any moment since the late 60s. And we have the urgency of the climate change, which was not present then. And the economy is far worse than it was then. And so to see this kind of like local, hyper-local activism, this hyper-local act of resistance and creativity at the same place, doing something so obviously good, was like, Wow, this is this is something that anyone can do in a 15-minute bike ride from their house. There's some stressed public resource. There's something that people can use their own personal leverage, their own friends, and do something that is of great consequence, and it can multiply. And to like see it, see this first thing flower. Yeah, I mean, realize that the food supply is short, and we all are moving to urban cities. And the population mm -hmm. next 50 years will be, will be very few farms, so this is necessary. Uh, let's talk a little about your relationship. I kind of got the gauge that the police are not your friends. Uh, yeah. But what about, what, what is the feeling of the faculty, the, 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 I mean, we met some of the faculty, the students, the, what is their feelings toward? Your, your, Policing? Toward, no, forget about the police. Oh, your feelings uh, toward, you know, they occupy the farm and the university. Um, I mean, it's, it's complicated, right? You have a situation where you've had the uh, kind of, Hmm. systemic and kind of methodical erosion of a public institution over time, and especially students' role within that university. Um, so you have the cutting of certain programs that aren't kind of oriented towards like technocratic teaching. Um, you have uh, large tuition increases, which kind of give us a higher debt burden. Um, and so it's been a uh, a illustration of how the university has transformed uh, its relationship to the production of a public good that is for everyone's benefit to this more kind of like customer product relationship um, that is often present. And so the university's rhetoric is, well, you know, the cost of our product is going up, and so we need to charge you more, right? And so I, I mention this because it's the frame through which I think a lot of students actually have had to start viewing their education, right? It's like an output that a lot of people have to get. And so people are very committed to the fact that like, no, I don't want to jeopardize my, my role in the university by participating in direct action, right? I, I don't want to compromise my, my standing. Um, and so there is that element, but there is also the element of, of that my standing won't matter if I don't do something about these situations now. Right, like me having a degree, degree from Berkeley doesn't matter if Oakland floods in 50 years. You know, like no one's gonna, care. no one's gonna care. They're gonna be like, "Can you swim?" More so than what, <laughs> like, what did you study? You know what I'm saying? So it's it's interesting to see how that dynamic plays out, and uh, I've noticed a generalized kind of like the society has been 
made more apathetic through various levels of degradation, right? And so what I say this because I, when I was on campus uh, most recently when the fee hikes were originally uh, announced and the regents meetings were happening in San Francisco, um, and I was talking to people and we were standing outside and talking about to students about how they were about to occupy this building and have an open occupation. And uh, people were kind of filing out of classes and uh, I was like asking, I was like just asking random people, just yelling basically, sometimes I do that. Uh, and I was like, what is that? How do you feel about the fee hikes? And people were like, it's sad. And that was it. And it was just this, they had this emotional response, but the emotional response didn't inspire action. And so um, I think what's really kind of crucial in this moment is, is creating these, these sorts of invitations for people to kind of like create outlets for that emotive response that they're having to really unfortunate and really terrible situations um, and allow them to express that in a way that creates something, as I said, larger than themselves. The, uh, yeah, the thing that really kind of surprised me, you tell me a little about your research, is the fact that UC Berkeley was allowing the corn <laughs> to only for corporate research, not for the general public. Right. How is that, how could you wrap your brain around that? Can you help me wrap my brain around that one? Because I don't understand how they couldn't share the research, at least with the public. Well, it goes to a little bit of what Ashoka was saying. On that piece of land, it's been a research farm for 80 years. Most of those 80 years, the research was for, uh, it's called a biological uh, control program. It was looking for organic ways to control pests, uh, mm -hmm. fungus, other predators, whatnot. And of course, if you don't use pesticide, that means the pesticide companies were not very happy with this program because it was very effective. Saved California billions of dollars. The research was given away for free. Um, it, was very, it was very effective. There are certain crops like walnuts that were spared tons of pesticides by the importation of a wasp that ate the, the pests that were plaguing uh -huh. walnuts. The entire cost for that was like under $10,000. So that meant they weren't buying tons of pesticide. So of course, that program was eroded over years and it was eventually dismantled. Its greenhouses and its offices on that site were demolished and they were moved out. At the same time, and there's a few professors that remained, like Miguel Altieri you see in the film, and then those people were replaced by corn gene researchers because the research they do, it's not GMO corn they're growing, but they're doing genetic research on corn for GMOs and the kind of things that can be patented, and then the university can sell those to, um, instead of giving away to the farmers for free, like the wasp and the walnuts, they're selling patents. So it's very much of moving from a, uh, as Ashoka says, from a public good, diffusing the research to the general public to something where they can monetize it. Right. It's the privatization of public resources. And this is just a very sophisticated version of privatization, but it's going on, I mean, they're selling the post offices, mm -hmm. there's tons of things that are being privatized. This is just a very sophisticated, a much more sophisticated scam. And it's being run by the regents of the University of California. And in my view, after making this film, indicates sort of an abdication of leadership on their part to come up with a more solid basis of funding. Right, mm -hmm. and I wanna, I wanna touch on that because the, uh, the idea that the research isn't public doesn't actually matter because corn genomics research is not useful for anybody mm -hmm. but a biotech company. Like I don't, I don't need to know the ins and outs of that patent because I don't have a genetics lab. I can't like action that research in a way that serves anybody in my community. And so like the public and private nature of it at this point is way too late. Like it's, it's the thrust of the research itself that would have to be guided by public interests, right? Because the way that it, it happens, whether it be at the British Petroleum Biosciences Facility, yeah, they have a building on campus. It's not too far from the Arthur Anderson Auditorium. Um, if you know who Arthur Anderson was, they were the accountant for Enron. Super, super <laughs> transparent people. Um, and so the, uh, it's just kind of a thrust. And so the, uh, the thrust of the research on our campus is very much so in, in support of corporate aims. And it's, it's a, at a technological level, 
that can't be implemented by the average person. Yeah, because they're not making extra corn for people in Africa that you know are no. starving or in better ways to grow it faster and no. more corn efficiently. No, no. Corn's it's, inedible. It's, yeah, they're using the genetic research for other products. It's not right. actually for corn. Right. And what we have, the University of California is really California's biggest, most important asset. I mean, it's what, how I got an education, it's how he got an education, it's how you're getting an education. Right. And th there's finite resources, and the research engine of this university is enormous and powerful, it ha but it is finite. And so that capacity, enormous as it is, is finite. If it is being directed towards the aims of corporations, that means it's not being directed towards other kinds of research. So it is displacing something for it to occur. Mm -hmm. And it's displacing things for the public good in favor of things that can be sold. Right. Uh, well, I'm having some fun, but let's let you guys have fun. So let's get some questions going. Well, first of all, congratulations, you know, on the film itself. It's magnificent. It's beautifully made. And Ashoka, too, for your commitment and uh, carrying your commitment from the university right into the, into the community. But um, uh, one of the things that really not only struck me but gave me a lot of hope was the, um, the dialectical split that seems to be uh, uh, forming, you might say, has formed in the course of this film in the university um, itself, uh, among its administrators. Um, uh, slowly you see a sort of slow realization that this far really could work, and that maybe the university isn't all that right in insisting on its so-called rights. Uh, there's this dialectical split is there within the, um, the agricultural faculty. Uh, there's, uh, I can't remember all the names. Uh, our letter is it, Miguel, anyhow, Professor Miguel, we'll call him, uh, yeah. who has a very different point of view from um, uh, poor old, uh, uh, Dustin Lish, who I feel rather sorry for at the end, going to Purdue. But um, uh, on the other hand, he's probably better off there. Um, you know, whether we're better off, I don't know. But uh, that's interesting that you have this. Uh, so that gives me hope, actually, that the granitic uh, kind of uh, bureaucratic structure of the university can be split. And even the, uh, the, uh, the rather pot-bellied but amiable de dean of agriculture uh, seems to be moving towards the, the point of view of the farmers. And uh, th this, is, uh, this is very hopeful. And um, I congratulate you on capturing all that. And uh, maybe you'd like to kind of elaborate both of you as to the, uh, that's a really a great victory, I think. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, I like, uh, something you said about the idea that the university is having a bit of a split, right? And so something that's not in the film is like a lot of the background work that we do in order to manipulate the university. Um, <laughs> and like that is a process of we go to their uh, committee meetings for things like what's called the Berkeley Food Institute. Um, we have people that sit on things like diversified farming systems. Like we, we re recognize very early that the university is not a monolith, and because of that, we can use it against itself. And so we can use the, the aims of the university against the means of the university, right? And so the aims of the university being like education and all those things that like uh, we want to hear, right? But the means of the university are like, you know, collateral debt on your tuition in order to finance construction or, uh, you know, like selling and developing land. Um, and so when we, we have this split essentially, but it's interesting when you notice the power dynamic where the capital projects dean's like, well, yeah, you know, if the natural resource dean wants to bring it to us and then we'll make the decision, right? Uh, with all of their academic training and uh, wherewithal, right? Um, we'll make it happen. Um, and so it shows kind of how skewed decision making is within the university, but the more kind of institutional buy-in that we have from members of the faculty, adjunct professors, students, graduate students, um, the more the university struggles to basically kind of like just make us outsiders, make this like an outside concern. Um, and so that actually gives the process a lot of power. Yeah. In addition to the um, savings that you're talking about, about the transportation of the food from agriculture to the city, um, we're now, with the drought, the governor's asking us to reduce our, our water consumption by 25%. And we know that agriculture is consuming 85% of the water in the state. Right. So I think I'm, I'm imagining that the use of water in the urban farming is much more water efficient 
than what is being, being utilized in the agriculture at large with the large irrigation and on large areas and a lot of wa water evaporation and things like that. And so I'm imagining there's a case that can be made that urban farming could be a potential way in which we can address some of the drought issues of our need to um, comply with the governor's mandate. And wonder if you have any thoughts that you would add to that. Yeah, this is, this is yeah, I think probably I'll do it. They, the, this is my next door neighbor in Venice, actually. He, that's how he makes his living, is he goes around and converts people's lawns into gardens. And, and, and they, it depends on how you do it. I mean, you can overwater things. You can certainly do it wrong and waste more water. But with the right sort of drip irrigation, the right kind of planting, you're right. You, food can be grown you know, using a lot less water than your lawn, for sure, right. and less water than they use in agribiz. The but I, I think we're, we're missing the point of a lot of what we're doing. Um, and like, yeah, there are material benefits. Like, it is more efficient to cut the commodity chains that stretch from here to Chile in order to bring us apples and blueberries in months that we don't have them. Um, and it is more, way more efficient to grow uh, food organically in what's known as polycultures instead of monocultures, um, not in the middle of a dry valley um, with like flood irrigation. These are all things that are true. Um, and I think, but there's like a human element that we're missing to what we're talking about, right? Um, and because agriculture is based on a long chain of exploitation. Um, whether it be one of the most pressing examples right now is currently the workers' strikes that are going on in uh, Baja, California um, with people like Driscoll Strawberries. If you don't know what's happening, I recommend that you look it up. Um, but there are thousands and thousands and thousands of farm workers protesting for better conditions. Like You have to understand these people are uh, exposed to horrible toxins every day, day in, day out, in back-breaking conditions. Um, and so re, uh, recentering our relationship to food in, at the scale of, of something that, that is imbued with a, a certain like innate humanness in a, in a process that's based on very like uh, tangible relationships that we have with each other within our communities is more of the point than the technical benefits of what we're talking about. We're talking about a technical, we're talking about a, a community-oriented process of the real allocation of all resources. Like food is a facet of a process that we need to imbue in uh, to our society as we distribute access to things like health and education and water. Um, food is just a segment of that. And so I don't want to get lost in this, in the kind of technocratic approach of, of food growing and what is the most efficient, what isn't, and lose sight of that. Well, one of the things you bring in, you mentioned the, the, the farm worker strikes. Uh, this is also the problem with corporatization of farming. Right. We, we, the local farmer is gone, fundamentally. Right. And these issues did not attack because they were a little more attached to the land. So is this kind of what you would think when you research with the corporatization? Is that, cause we, didn't, we only touched on it a little, but these are problems about corporate farming and you know, the chickens and the new banners. That's something where bigger concern is letting corporations run our farming. Yeah, industrial farming is, is pretty brutal. Anyone who's ever worked in it would know that it's, it's the food movement in general, in fact, someone said this recently to me, that, that the food movement in general is if you go down any path of the food movement, you end up at some problem of justice. It's either how the farm workers are being treated, how the water is being used, how, uh, the, the, how the soil is being depleted, the wrong, you know, it's being dumped on with pesticides and, and petrochemicals. So the food system is really, um, I think, a very powerful tool to look at our range of climate change and economic and political issues. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's uh, so the food movement is, if you're interested in good food, you will wind up, if you follow any of the threads, you're gonna wind up in some political justice situation, you know, some, something problematic. Mm -hmm. Did you realize when you did that, you were touching on a lot of social issues far beyond this. Did you realize that when you guys in it or you just kind of when the, uh, occupy the farm? Were you realizing that we were going after a lot of other things that's a lot larger than this? Yeah. 
Definitely. I mean, there. Uh, I don't think that we understood the effect that it would have more broadly, but the vast majority of us were coming from it from a very like critical analytical approach, and a lot of us are steeped in the lineages of social movements, um, and we're students of social movements, and so we understood it was like, well, there's this, there's this is an intersectional issue, right? This is an issue that touches multiple things, but it's a tangible way to like hold on to a lot of those things, right? It's a tangible way to like change the way our system devalues life to create a process for ourselves that values our own lives, right? And so that that touches on access, that touches on nutrition, that touches on health. It touches on a lot of these things um, that exist within our society, but are usually made abstract. And so when we thought about it, we were like, yes, we're going to do it this way. Like, there's very little of um, what you see that wasn't planned in some way in the beginning. You know, like six months of planning went into this action to be able to show up with this many, this many supplies. And then when we talk about, there were definitely serendipitous things that would happen, like when they shut off the water and we had to organize around that. But once we organized it around that, we had a process. We had a list of people that we were calling. We had a schedule that was being done. Like these, it was very, very, um, there were, the kitchen was ran in a certain way. And so there's a, there's definitely, it wasn't very willy nilly, we were very, methodical and uh, and uh, kind of committed to the way that we were doing things, especially around like decision making, right, of, mm -hmm. of how much consensus we were going for um, among a group of strangers, which is kind of unheard of. <laughs> wow, three years. Isn't it just about three years? Yes. That three year this, anniversary this, this Earth Day. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Pretty amazing. A long, long journey. Um, I think that part of the the magic that happens when you're making this kind of film, as events are unfolding around you, is being in the right place at the right time and uh, having the smarts to recognize what's happening around you and, and the smarts to focus your camera on the individuals that are going to really tell that story. And Todd, you did such a, it's an amazing, everything came together. Are you a filmmaker or an activist? <laughs> And, you know, and, and, and when did you know that you would find the project, that you'd found the project that would combine both of those uh, uh, tendencies uh, so well? Um, by the way, that's Steve Nelson, who did sound for several days for me for free and helped me on the film. So he's... Uh, he's <laughs> but he, he didn't tell me he was going to ask me this question. Um, <laughs> Am I an activist or a filmmaker? Can't you be both? Can't you be both? Uh, I, I uh, uh, you know, I, I was drawn to activism, you know, I've been an activist, you know, especially when I was younger, but then, you know, it wasn't, it didn't, it wasn't quite enough, and I enjoyed the creativity of filmmaking, but then I don't enjoy the idiocy of Hollywood, and uh, I did have a you know, I've, I have had a funny tra trajectory through working in Los Angeles in the film and television business, and and, uh, and uh, at one point in uh, my career, I thought, oh, you know, if I just keep working really hard at this, and I get good at it, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get I'll get a chance to make it, you know, the projects I want to make. Wrong. <laughs> and uh, so, th but this, and so I really started putting more, much more time into finding stuff that could be done, you know inexpensively and it would be closer to my heart and uh, and you know if you don't leave the house you're not going to find it so I, I can't say that this was this was this was a serendipitous thing but it was you know in, in a line of looking for something like this and it was uh, it, and as I say I've never had a project that uh, sort of meshed so much with uh, how I feel and I also, too, I mean, I have to say, everything that he's saying, and all the plans that they were talking about, it's not like I thought about that. I mean, I didn't have this fully developed. I mean, I've learned a lot from them. I, I didn't arrive at the party with everything that he's saying. You know, I didn't spend the previous six months to making this thinking about what they were thinking. So it's changed me. So I can't exactly say I'm an activist in this sense because I am more of an observer and, a, and because I 
you know, was attuned to what they were doing, was able to follow this story and made sure that I had both sides of it, or all sides of it, there's really multiple sides, and um, just felt like a responsibility to tell it accurately and as completely as possible in a, in a dyna dynamic way. So, I mean, I really felt like um, not quite so much as an activist, but more as a filmmaker, because I felt like that's my responsibility right here. They have enough activists, they don't even know they're activists. <laughs> no, no, don't listen to them. Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> not true. <laughs> in the sense of my own participation, I felt like I had more to bring to the party as a filmmaker than as an activist. Hmm. You know, they didn't need another opinion. <laughs> Well, let's, let's, uh, let's move this into the lobby so we can have some face-to-face -face time with you. I'd like to thank our two guests. Thank you so much for coming. And let's continue the dialogue over some lovely organic food.